Why don't you? She reads my mind. I don't even get to finish the sentence. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Echo Ties on October 13th, 2021. I don't know how it is October already, but it seems we're halfway through it. Um, we want to welcome you to this session. I know you're going to enjoy um, our main presenter today, but as you know, we always have a few announcements to get us started. Um, well, I'm going to use the uh, slides to go through some of those announcements. So this is Echo Ties 2021, 2022. We are um, sponsored by the Oregon Department of Education and housed at Douglas Education Service District. And this is regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairments. My name is Gail Bowser, and I'm going to be the host uh, this morning for this Echo Ties session. I work as an independent consultant to uh, RSOI and um, as, was at one time the coordinator of RSOI, which is where I met our presenter today. Um, our as I said, I work as an independent consultant, but one of the things I wanted to say to you is I am uh, acting as an expert consultant for three different ECHO sessions these days. The RSOI one on uh, therapy and educational settings, also Oregon Technology Access Program's ECHO Voices, which is about alternative and augmentative communication. And I also work for the University of Wyoming as a consultant to their ECHO and assistive technology. So I spend a lot of time echoing things these days. Our real host today is Deborah Fitzgibbons. She's the RSOI coordinator and also coordinator of the Oregon Technology Access Program. So she, uh, has made some amazing changes since she took over five years ago. And one of them is to institute a great deal of professional development that is virtual. And Deb, I have to brag on Deb because we started that kind of virtual professional development even before the pandemic. Deb, do you want to say good morning? I will say good morning and I'll agree with that, Gail. We were, <laughs> we were um, virtual before it was cool. <laughs> and uh, moving away, and and so when things flipped where we needed to be virtual, it didn't stop us, didn't slow us down a bit. So welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see all of you. We're starting to feel like family. I love it when your names stop pop, start popping up. Thanks, Gail. That is one of the things that I love about um, our Echo Network is that we do get to know each other in whole new ways. So. We'd love to see your face if you can do that. I realized, whoops, I didn't. Some of us are in classrooms or still in our jammies because it's eight o'clock. So um, if you can un, uh, open up your camera, we'd love to see you because it helps us get to know each other. You were muted as you entered the session, but we encourage you to unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can type them in the chat box. Um, Melissa has said that, <coughs> excuse me, Melissa has said that she uh, loves, loves it when we have dialogue, um, can, you know, ask questions as we go along because it makes for a, a more community of practice type of presentation. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to add that, you know, I know there's lots of people and reasons people don't have their camera on. And, you know, I know one of them is uh, the bandwidth resources because everybody's on and it kind of slows things down. But anytime you want to show us your face, we love that. But uh, we realize there's lots of reasons. So thank you. We do have a uh, closed captioning available on Zoom um, and it is turned on. So if you want to see the live transcript, just go to this uh, icon that looks like this, or it may be in the more button uh, on your screen, depending on how your screen is set up. I, my computer is taking off on its own. Um, 
you, uh, we know that a lot of people like closed caption, captioning for more than just uh, the reason that they have a hearing impairment. It helps many of us concentrate better, things like that. So it's available to you if you want it. You will receive a certificate uh, for one, uh, one and a quarter contact hours for your um, participation in today's session. Um, there is a new registration process that allows us to get those certificates to you right away. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. You must do this process if you want the the uh, contact hours for today. So at one time only, you need to um, sign up, sign up for an account. Well, for Pete's sakes, I'm sorry, I'm not pushing buttons. It's just going on by itself. Uh, you need to sign up for an account. So this is your uh, account screen and you just fill in some basic information and submit your registration. That happens uh, pretty quickly and easily. And, um, and then you will move on to a screen automatically that says log in and register. Going to get out of this PowerPoint. <laughs> log in and register. And that will take you to uh, the screen that actually gets you into this the session. So you've probably already done that because you're in today's session, but also you can go back to that screen and see your, this must have an automatic thing on it. Um, see your participation uh, in previous sessions and also get your uh, certificates or get any information. I want to talk today about the statewide town hall for therapists. It's coming up our next, we had one this week, and the next one is coming up on November 8th, 2021. I, from 1.30 to 3.30, the Zoom link is here, and you should be getting notices about these town hall meetings as, uh, as it gets closer to the date. These sessions have been just amazing open question and answer sessions, and um, we've heard from therapists, not only in Oregon, but all over the country, that they are really uh, contributing to the body of knowledge and really getting at some of the very specific questions you had. We started it because of the pandemic, but there's no intention to, um, to stop because we've found them so valuable for therapists and a, and a chance to really get your questions answered by people like the licensing boards and our state ODE people um, attend. We try and invite our, um, our people like that uh, based on the questions that you submit ahead of time. So if you have questions ahead of time and you want the right people at the meeting, let us know. Uh, what your questions are, and you can do that by contacting Deb directly. I just wanted to mention that you never know who's going to drop by because of our announcements out there and the people from the state who work with the uh, state assessments um, dropped in uh, with us. They're part of our accessibility committee, but she introduced herself, and I would love to have her back in the future after people have a moment to consider um, the barriers, potential barriers that you work with with kids, you know that there are access barriers and there need to be alternative methods of taking the test and all. So consider those things because she really wants to be part of making uh, changes on the assessment. She's a go-getter, uh, Caitlin Gonzalez. And so think about that. Do you work with kids who have difficulty accessing text or testing? Thanks, Gail. Thank you, Deb. We also have our uh, annual feeding seminar coming up and uh, this year it will be on November 4th and 5th and it will be virtual. We thought long and hard about whether we could have a face-to-face -face meeting again, but November just seems too early. So hopefully next year's feeding seminar will be face-to-face -face and live again, but save the dates for this and you'll be seeing announcements and registration information coming out about this. 
uh, seminar for feeding teams in the near future. If you haven't already. Gail, if you don't mind, I'm going to make one more comment about that. You're going to see and hear that we will be launching our new <laughs> ECHO network, and it will be ECHO for swallowing and feeding in a school environment. So it's going to be once monthly, um, and it's going to be led by Emily Homer, who is really um, uh, expertise uh, uh, galore about uh, team building and, and helping setting up teams to get started and focused um, uh, feeding teams. And so um, it's going to be monthly and it's going to be the third Thursday of the month, uh, each month throughout the year. So you'll see the first one during our feeding seminar. I posted the link to registration in the chat box. Thanks, Gail. Thank you, Deb. Um, next time we meet will be October 27th. That'll be our next Echo Ties session. And um, we're going to be talking about the PEEP, the Student Personal Emergency and Evacuation Plan. This was a project that we started again before the pandemic um, because the Oregon Department of Education had a, a special, has a special federal grant about evacuation protocols. At first, that grant was really focused on um, things like fires and threats in the school and stuff like that. But as you know, we had to switch some of that energy to um, <clears throat> talking about uh, COVID-19. And so we'll have Alex Hayslip, who will be presenting from the uh, from the project and then Deb Fitzgibbons, our own Deb Fitzgibbons, who has really led the effort to do that, will be um, presenting on the PEEP form itself and some of the ways it's being used in schools. Exactly, and, and so this is us um, listening to therapists that said that we need to really have a focus on this, it's not consistent. And so uh, we, at our conferences, we held focus groups and we pulled together the examples of PEEPs that were already being used. We pulled the best practices out of each one. And then we tied the vocabulary, the language to the FEMA training because they say in their training, um, and don't forget about people with disabilities. Okay, give us more. And so this is the more that we're hoping for. I did put a link in the chat box to the current version of that. If you wanna take a look, it's a, it's a walk through that and a discussion as much as it is a, um, a, a presentation. So that's coming up. Thank you. Today, I am very happy to introduce you to Melissa Sheldon. Um, she and I have known each other for I, even longer than I imagined today. Um, and uh, I have always been, been amazed at the kind of information that she provides because she's a deep thinker. And that's the, the, the thing that always helps me. I, I'm going to show you her bio here, but I'm not going to read it to you. I'll let her talk about what's important about the work she does. But I do want to say that Melissa is one of the people that when I read something she's written, I often go, well, duh, why didn't I think of that? So um, I really value her contribution and I'm sure that you will also val oops, value her contributions. I'm going to stop sharing so she can share and say welcome. Thank you so much, um, Gail and Deb. I, I really appreciate the invitation. And um, both of them neglected to say how um, difficult it has been just to arrange this because of my wonky responsiveness and my all, all the places I get emails from all over the world, the ones from Oregon go into my spam. So I don't know if you guys know something. I don't, but um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, it has been, been an uphill uh, struggle, so I appreciate your perseverance um, in, in inviting me, and um, I've only been to Oregon a few times, but I have such positive um, memories and experiences, and I'm pretty sure the conference that I spoke at, I, I sort of said back um, about what Gail 
and just said, of sort of reflecting the mirror back on you all, um, long, beautiful, strong history in Oregon of professional development and seeking evidence-based practice and providing support across for families and children and students across that, that timeline and age span. And assistive technology, one of the places I always dig around and look and think about because um, you guys have always had your head on around, the Oregon head on around um, what uh, evidence-based practice can look like. So I'm honored to be here. And um, I want to just afford everyone the, um, the notion, I'm not trying to force you to turn on your camera, but if you're eating or you feel like you look like a pig or whatever, I do not care. Like it does not matter to me one bit. Um, and it sounds like you guys are becoming your own um, practice family. And so if you want to turn it on, you are not gonna distract me. If you have children, dogs, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I feel like I get to know you better if that happens. The other thing is likely I could talk for 30 minutes without even taking a breath. So Gail and Deb, you interrupt me if I'm extending the time or um, spinning off into space on something that we don't need to, to do. I appreciate the guardrails. So I won't take it as, I'll take it as support. Um, so the, uh, the, the talk today, I had to think long and hard about. In fact, let me go ahead and share my screen. I think I should probably, oop, hang on a second. I've already goofed it up. Um, let me make sure. Now, of course, when I practiced this, it worked out great. I moved it over on screen too, so that's why it's acting funny. So, back, let me move it again. And I want screen one. And, sorry about this, guys. You are among friends. We've all been <laughs> Thank you. And it didn't work, did it? No, oh, we see it. You do? Okay. So I'm not. Just now do you still see it? Just maximize your screen. No. No. Okay. No, it no. is sharing from now. Screen. I see my own email. <laughs> okay. That's, That's what. it. Okay. It's just going to share from that screen, which that'll work better, actually. Okay. So okay. now go to we... the top and click on display settings. Did you try that one already? Mm. And then swap presenter okay. view. There we go. There you Perfect. go. You got it? We got uh, it. Okay. Well, thank you, Deb. <laughs> TA in the moment, just like that. So thank you very much. Um, but what, what I wanted to make sure today was that um, probably this probably isn't a great way to start, but I don't want anyone to feel guilty or shoulded. I don't know if that's a word you guys use. You know, I should read more. I should do this. To me, that is not what this discussion is about at all in any way, shape or form. Um, I feel like the years uh, experience with what we've been through has sort of taught us if nothing that we all really focus on doing the best we can in each and every circumstance. And I have yet to meet a practitioner um, who isn't doing that. And I might even add, some of the practitioners I meet might be uh, misguided, I'll say, but they still are working really, really hard and trying. They're just um, maybe needing additional information or they've gotten themselves off on a track and are unable to sort of reflect and think about how that fits with the big picture. But still, hard working, dedication, commitment. Um, is is always there. So my hat's off to you to extend that. And I'm hopeful that this gives folks some ideas um, about what we can do. Um, and I know this term is overused, boots on the ground, but I think about that all the time. Like what can, how can we work, you know, smarter and get, we call them two furs and three furs. You know, if I'm going to read an article, how can I make that maximize something else that an opportunity that I need to do in my regular work day? So that's my effort. So you guys can give me feedback about that at the end if, if, we'd, um, if we've accomplished that. So I thought first it's good to just sort of what are we all talking about here in terms of what implementation fidelity looks like or what I'm talking about related to fidelity to practice. And it's this notion that 
um, the characteristics have been defined of an intervention around an intervention such that we can reflect on what those those um, characteristics are and see how well what we're doing is matching to that. And what's cool about talking about this topic is we could be talking about, and I gave you guys some examples of um, coaching and um, working with a parent um, who has an infant with torticollis. So we have an evidence-based practice of stretching. We have um, a, the practice of using context and function. So all of these, um, the, sort of the big conceptual framework is has the practice been defined in such a way that we actually know what it is and we're not just all um, thinking we're doing it, but how are we demonstrating that we're doing it? So um, that's the idea there. And, and I will say, I don't know what you all think, but I find sometimes the definition of practices to be somewhat elusive. Um, even from some really famous people, you know, who write a lot or train a lot. And I'm like, actually, what does that look like? And what, what are you talking about? And where can I read more about what that is? Um, so if you find yourself struggling to think, okay, what does this aspect look like? Um, don't always take the blame that it might be your lack of understanding, but there could be lack of clarity um, out there. And then really exciting, I just wanted to make sure um, that you all knew about, and I'm sure you do, but this um, website, NIRN, N-I-R-N, and you've got it on the um, resources, but there's a whole scientific area on implementation and looking at what helps people implement a, a strategy or an intervention to fidelity. What are the barriers? Um, what facilitates a culture or environment around um, a change or a new innovation happening? It's very interesting, but that's not what we're talking about today because we're talking about us and how we can um, take accountability for what it is we're doing and looking at outcomes. Um, but I did want to offer to you guys, you're in an environment that is very rich and um, has a lot of like the possibility of um, implementations happening at the level of fidelity is there because the number one predictor on successful innovations being adopted is involved in positive leadership. And so when you all think about the opportunities, I was overwhelmed, I was writing them down. I got like three new ideas with what you guys already have scheduled and are doing. The town hall, I'm gonna do one before Christmas here in Kansas. Um, yeah, so that is so exciting because even though me, myself, in my school where I work, I can do things that I, I can control my behavior, but if I don't have a culture or leadership who's energized about that change, it's extremely difficult. I can do it, but it, you can just imagine if you're in an environment that is more supportive and informed and has goals and outcomes and, and is measuring that, it makes a huge difference. So as we kind of look at our individual selves, here's what I was hoping you guys would tell me. So any of these questions, kind of why are, why are you here? Why did you show up early this morning instead of doing what, you know, the other things that you would be doing or could be doing? Um, how do you currently stay on top of things? And what are some things you do to push yourself when you're feeling overwhelmed or tired or smart enough? Um, or all those things that kind of come together um, to help us take our, you know, our step out every day and implement our, our strategies and interventions. What are some of the things you guys already do? You, um, you can put them in the chat or if you want to unmute, I'm happy for you to do that as well. Uh, in the chat, it says, uh, Melanie says, I collaborate with coworkers. Okay. And Melanie, guess what? That is the number one way 
that therapists, OT, PTs, and speech pathologists get information. So here's the deal. I'm sure you do, but we want to make sure we have smart coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that with love in my heart. Uh, but, you know, if we're depending on each other, we got to make sure we got some reliable uh, sources there. Num number one strategy. Okay. There's another comment for me. These Echo Ties workshops have helped me stay the course with evidence-based practice um whoa now they're coming in fast it's oh, good yeah the, the passion to do right for our students uh, melanie says lucky i do have smart co-workers <laughs> yes. i attend professional development reviews cats and e evidence-based practice summaries mm -hmm. uh go to conferences online collaborate and follow pts on instagram um a lot of comments about having good co-workers and good. yeah it's it's interesting and and i don't want this to sound um I, it might sound a little bit tough the 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 notion of depending on our team and our co-workers and you guys are going to see one of the suggestions i have is work on a team be on a team don't be by yourself but be in an environment where you have access to people but we have to watch that we don't create our own bubble and we kind of work in that bubble. So we always have to kind of be poking and pushing and making sure that we're um, considering new ideas or different ideas. And the, um, I love the comment about, you know, I plan on coming to these workshops because there are probably topics that come up that you may be like, oh, I wouldn't have thought to read more about that or learn more about that. And I think when you're open to learning, you have these experiences where you can apply information like, oh, that would work with what I'm doing in this project, or that would work with this child or student. So it, it being open to engaging is, is huge. I was kind um, of kidding. I was kind of kidding, Gail, when I said, you know, that we think we're smart enough. Um, you know, I think most people I know in this area never feel like they're smart enough. We sort of, we hedge on the side of feeling like an imposter, like when are people going to find out I don't really know anything, you know, because I am worried that I'm not going to. So the comment about the passion, you know, to do, do right by our consumers is, is huge for that drive. Absolutely. You know, there there is one other comment I want to call out here. Brittany says, uh, wants to remind us to take data, outcome data. Um, Absolutely, Brittany. And that's kind of where I was headed to that, you know, in this, in this day and age, um, just because Gail and I have known each other a long time, we can sort of think back to, um, you know, there was no talk of fidelity. There was no talk of being accountable for outcomes from the federal level to the state level to the programmatic level. I mean, we always had outcomes on IEPs and then IFSPs, but honestly, um, where those data went in terms of not reaching outcomes in the old days, that was not really even talked about. It was just kind of, oh, we need to write new goals or, oh, we didn't meet the outcomes. Um, and it, it's kind of embarrassing when I think back about, you know, the lack of regard we had had for that piece. And it's taken us a long time. Um, one of the more, I mean, I think it sounds kind of snarky when I say this, but, you know, one of the things that troubles me is um, I, I feel like I still live in a time where it can be more difficult to be paid for a current evidence-based practice than it is to get paid for something billable, you know, services for something that's clearly out of date just because the system lags behind so much of what we know but then when we look at the medical field um you know when i was in my physical therapy training if a patient had a shoulder reconstruction surgery they could be in the hospital a week easily and not start rehab for at least a couple of weeks and I don't know if any of you all have been through that, but nowadays it's outpatient and you're moving that shoulder within 24 to 48 hours, depending upon the protocol. So 
a surgeon who says, no, I really liked it when I could have my patients in the hospital for a week and then they could rest. And it's like too bad. You can't do that because you're not going to get paid for it. But in our field, we sort of see this huge variation of what that can look like. And we really do have the onus of responsibility on us to think about how am I making sure that I'm, I'm doing that. And it's easy to say, um, hard to do, easy to say. Okay, thank you guys for, for sharing. So I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. You don't have to you know, answer or respond, but I just wanted us all to think about this sort of how, what's that other layer of I'm trying, I put myself out there, I'm learning, but how do I know? Like, how do I know if what I'm doing is up to date? And I, I, one of the more recent experiences um, I had with this was I come from a time where the parenting strategy of using timeout was the preferred strategy, preferred over, you know, we sort of think about what the alternatives were like spanking, um, uh, yelling, like those types of things that none of us are fans of. Um, and then when the information came out um, for young children, uh, the brain science piece of what young children's brains are doing when isolated and making that comment that it's, it, you know, it shows up and lights up in a child's brain the same way physical discipline does, it was shocking to me. And still, meeting people regularly who are recommending time out that sort of you know one minute for every year they are old um, and that's not evidence-based so it's it ca things catch on and we do them i was taught that in school in my special ed degree I was taught that um, but now it's not current so how do i know what are the strategies i put in place to make sure and then you know staying up to date so what are the strategies I put in place? Um, how do I know the resources I'm going to are, and I'm accessing information are evidence-based? Um, when I teach the research class, the physical therapy students, I always have one who says, well, you can find research to support anything you want to. Um, and I always have to bite my tongue and that I don't <laughs> snap back. But the, the idea of that is, but, how am I evaluating the research? Am I, you know, my in terms of my level of being a good consumer of that information? How do I know? Um, and probably the big one: How do I make time? How, how do I make this a part of my regular work day? Uh, I can, without even looking at you guys, know that some of you do what I did for a long time: was you know my journals that I would get, the articles that I would get. Um, now you probably save them. I would, you know, print them off and stack them up, or I would stack the journals next to my bed, and then I would start reading one with good intention. And I don't know, maybe I'd make it two minutes and forty-five seconds before I, you know, crash and fall asleep, um, because I was feeling guilty that I needed to keep up with that information and and be informed. Um, and how much is enough? How do I know? Uh, one of the comments, Gail, I, I know you read was I read evidence-based practice briefs. So I go, you know, and I, that, that's one of the suggestions, being smart about the information. If you can find a synthesis or somebody else is already doing that work for you, take advantage of that opportunity. At, you know, as long as you know that's a sound resource um, for, for that, that's a great strategy. And you know, here is this, these last three kind of all go together about you know, what do our clients, and I use that term on purpose because I think it, it's a, that word varies. One of you already mentioned the students. Um, many of us, you know, I felt sometimes when I was working in a school, the, uh, the teachers were my consumers because I was really supporting what they were doing with the students when I wasn't around. Um, parents and families, um, and you all know, it, it's just like, you know, if I, if I can use the analogy of, you know, when you go to your, your physician, you believe that physician is going to be current and up to date. And, and certainly I think there's an aspect of all of us that if a, a, a physician or a, a, we're having a consultation from a specialist, you know, if that person were to say, 
you know, I'm not really up on that, but I know somebody who is, I think we all have a level of respect in that because I've heard that because I would certainly want someone to tell me they don't know something versus acting like they do. But the idea that, um, you know, most people are not wondering if we know what we're doing. They believe that we know what we're doing and they trust us that we know what we're doing. And again, one of you already mentioned, that's a big driver for you. That's an implementation driver. That term actually is there. Um, and I think I was scared all the way through my physical therapy program like that, that I was gonna, someone was gonna need to know something and I wouldn't know it. And there we'd be, you know, without, without that. Um, and then I think this last one is, you know, is something I have to admit when I was younger, I didn't really think about it as much, but you know, what's my opinion of myself in terms of my efficacy and my ability to achieve those outcomes. Because I think a lot of us, you know, it, it's sort of how I started. We just do our best every day. We have more, most people have more work to do than you feel like you can do well. I don't know, I might be presuming things, but I always feel that way, that if I had more time, my product would be better. If I had more time, um, you know, I would have more information or more data, like someone mentioned. So. Um, that piece of balancing that I don't lose my confidence, but I challenge myself about my competence in ways that keep me you know, out there and open and, and on the edge, I think is key for what this looks like. I wanted to show you a, a couple of examples. You have the handouts of some tools that are out there related to um, implementation with fidelity and let me see if I can I'm gonna stop sharing just so I can see if they'll pull up here Probably gonna, they're all layered back here here we go and one of them is called the at a glance for evidence-based practices and the other one is the roadmap so you have those handouts. I just want to show you what they, they look like. Can you see it? Oh, kind of that obnoxious uh, yellowish green color. And it's uh, got some, this, this was a, a tool we put together. Dathan Rush and I should have said that. Um, he, he and I have worked together for many years to look at implementation and utilization of, of innovation. And um, these are just some topics um, uh, that have questions related to helping me stay current in specific areas. And this was um, related to understanding, um, we spend a lot of time helping um, in early intervention practitioners understand the importance of working with the adults, just like in schools, the importance of the teacher understanding a strategy, you know, for example, if the only time a certain activity happens for a child is when I'm there as the physical therapist, that is not enough. Um, and so what are ways that we support that, um, the people in those environments to be able to know what to do and, and how to do it, but not turn them into junior therapists, but help, you know, help it be a part of the environment. Um, and this tool, there's a front and a back, and you guys look at it. Um, there are these questions that you can ask yourself about, you know, based on what I, what just happened, what changed? Like, what did that person learn because I was here today? Or what was different for the student because I was here today? And I'm using this in a way that it's just a, a self-check each day. You can have it in your, you know, however you manage your stuff, in your, your clipboard, on your phone, um, on your tablet, however you do that. Um, just a way to sort of double check um, where I am with knowledge, um, understanding, and utilization. Um, the roadmap is a little bit, um, I think I probably can, let me try again. Um, while you're looking, I, there's, mm -hmm. Uh, several people asking where we where they can find the handouts for today, and Deb has that link. So I'm hoping you can put that in the chat, Deb. I think it's in there too. If you scroll up in the chat higher, I think I saw it in there. But 
we have um, developed a lot of these roadmaps. I should check. Can you see that, Gail? Am I showing the right thing? Yeah. Yep. Double check. Okay. And um, the roadmaps are the uh, the color coding means something. So if you take a look at the color coding, that starting here is usually um, purple or gray. I think that's supposed to be a purplish color, but the green is actually questions that um, provide guidance for, and this is sort of if someone asks you about a, a practice or if you see a practice being implemented, um, but this also works for myself, you know, if I ask myself these questions. And then the yellow codes are really for how do I get more information? And this roadmap, we have a lot, um, it's in the resources, I'll, I'll point it out to you guys when we get there, um, but this is the only one with a red box. And it just says, stop doing what you're doing if you don't have research to support it. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. So that's why we made it red, like we wanted to get people's attention. But, um, you know, practices that are um, not, and, and you know, there are categories. There's certainly evidence-based. There are promising practices. There are levels of rigor with which um, interventions have been looked at. Um, and I wasn't planning on, you know, us talking about that today, but if I'm just doing it because I'm just winging it or I'm doing it because somebody else was doing it, I really have to pause and I need a more stable base than that. Um, if I can, um, you know, I, I think, you know, some really pop popular uh, strategies, I'll take one of the sacred ones, like uh, deep pressure brushing. Is, is one that a lot of therapists use um, and has very little, if any, research to support it. But I think we all know stories of it being a strategy that works with some students and some children. And so what's my basis for giving it a try? How long would I try it? How do I weigh the pros and cons? And that sort of cost benefit ratio and cost can mean more than money, time, effort, um, what, what am I asking the teacher to do and what would she be doing or he would be doing instead, you know, those types of things. But it, it's, you know, I've seen where people are using it over and over and over for days and weeks and months. And that's not, you know, the, the promising information about it is we should see changes in a couple of weeks if we're going to see changes happen. So we have, that's one example of being informed about what that um, looks like and how do I dig around and find information um, what, what are those reliable places that I can go to and that is really to me that's what we're talking about here is can I support what I'm doing and if I do a lot of it I should really understand the research re related to that and think about what that um, can look like so there are all kinds of tools um, I already alluded to this, but Gail mentioned, someone already said, I read evidence-based practice briefs. Um, and so some of the resources I put on the uh, slide where we talk about resources, that's why I put them, because they've synthesized it for you and they're updating it, um, or they've done a literature review and they have the results of that. So you've got it in your hand um, to read it. Um, the uh, I'm getting off on resources on this. Um, shift back here and we can think about this in a different way. So let me go back to this. And all right, are we back to the PowerPoint? I need to make it go. Uh, we're seeing your presenter view again. Okay, now. I'll do what Deb taught me. There we go. No, okay, thank you. All right. So easy things, that's why I ask first. Um, and that first one sounds a bit judgy and pushy. I mean, I can't see all of your faces right now, you know, because the screen is limited, but I always do like to ask how many people belong to your professional organization and I would be a big fibber. Yeah, I see some people raising your hands. Excellent. And we could probably talk 20 minutes about why you do and how helpful you think it is. Um, 
And I left my, uh, I left APTA for a while because I got really mad at them and frustrated with them. Um, you know, and what did my mom used to say? You cut your nose off to spite your face, something like that, you know, that, you know, to what end? Um, they didn't change a thing because I got mad. <laughs> but, but the the idea of resources at your fingertips is really um, where our professional associations are right now. Um, with ASHA for speech language pathologists, AOTA, APTA, and then particularly um, because, and I think most people know, all PTs know this, but uh, speech pathologists and OTs may know this. You guys are lucky because your organizations, pediatrics makes up a big chunk of your field. For PTs, we're this little slice of all the PTs who are out there. So we have always had the pediatric section, but now we have the American Academy of Pediatric Physical Therapy, and it's a huge resource. Um, but the other thing is, I think the associations are getting smarter and you don't have to be a paying member to get at a lot of the resources. So they're understanding the, you know, doing things for the good, the general good out there. But being a member there um, is, is major for access. Um, Division for Early Childhood is a, a, a huge association that provides a lot of training and support for evidence-based practice. And um, I will tell you, that was actually the first place when I went to my first conference that I felt like, okay, these are my people. Like I was around early childhood teachers and school-based therapists and the, those folks that the focus of that conference was about um, evidence-based practices in schools and early intervention and, and what that looks like. And it's about, the cost of it is about 25% of belonging to a perfect, you know, our discipline specific association. So about a hundred bucks, you get three journals, you get all this information. Um, reading things, I already mentioned uh, being on a team, reading things um, is, is really important. I think a lot of people are sick to death of reading by you know, the end of the day. So how do I read things during the day or in prep for the day? Um, and we already talked about the things that we read. So um, very important. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about this one, using my everyday practice to hold myself accountable and being thoughtful about each intervention and interaction um, that I have. Um, and this sort of implies you have go-to websites, journals, resources, uh, but if you don't get some, because I think we spend a lot of time spinning around, oh, I should read all of this, when really, if you identify your go-to spots, you've got a good foundation for what you um, should be doing. And I use that should word um, sparingly, I try to. Um, you're in a community of practice, you're here, that's what this is. Um, the opportunity, I, I think when um, Gail and Deb started us out, those town halls are opportunities for commu ongoing community of practice, all of those pieces that have the information there. And then one of the motivators for Dathan and I around coaching was the amount of research supporting peer coaching or buddy coaching, you know, finding somebody that you, you know, there, there is a several, there are several studies of people who go to a conference or a workshop, professional development, they're excited, they go back. If you have a buddy that you're working on that together and you're talking about it, the likelihood of the implement of the innovation taking hold increases by something like 60% versus if you're by yourself and you're just trying your hardest. Um, so it gives this opportunity for reflection and teams can take it on. You know, let's, this is what we want to accomplish this year. We have a gap in, since you guys have all these resources, in feeding and swallowing knowledge. How can we tighten up that gap so that we have more information? What can each of us do? So you have that way of challenging each other. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, when you've made a plan with your community of practice to have read a certain chapter or reviewed a certain article or looked at a website and it's tomorrow, 
you're more likely to do it than if you're just said to yourself, I was going to do that this week, right? So we have, we have people who are counting on us being engaged with them in a, in a thoughtful way so that we can um, all learn together. And we're reliant, you know, on one another to help us um, stay within those guardrails. So I know these are not earth shattering. They're, it's not anything that anybody's, you know, not thought of. But the um, here's the other thing I wanted to say too is if there's something that you're excited about, like oh I want to read that you know article or oh I want to go to that website, do it and enjoy it and don't think about all the things you're not doing, but thinking about what you are doing and how you can expand that. And one of the things I learned early on in grad school was if I found an article I really liked. The goal mine was in the back of that article when I went to the reference list because that was all the stuff that led to that article. So if I wanted to go deeper, I had it right there in my hand of what I needed to go and um, take a look at. And I don't know, you guys, if this even holds true anymore. You know, they, there's a joke about, you know, when you're talking to someone older and they say, you know, I, well, I had to walk to school and it was five miles and I had to wear my brother's shoes because I didn't have shoes and I, you know, we didn't have a coat, you know, you hear all these things. Um, I do like to remind folks, um, there are some of us that when we were in grad school, you know, there wasn't an internet. And if you wanted an article, you had to go to the closest university library and try to find it. And if you found it, you had to pay to get it copied. Um, and copies of pages back then were like, you know, a quarter a piece. It was not, you know, so you'd be paying $30 for an article. Um, and, oh, I forgot the part. Sometimes you had to wait like weeks, months. So now we have this opposite thing of at your fingertips, you can be flooded with information instantaneously. And that can be overwhelming too. So how do I weed through that? Again, we're back to what are my reliable sources so that I know if I have a few minutes, how do I make sure I'm where I need to be? So these next two pages, we're not going to belabor these, but I just wanted you to have, these are some of my favorites. They're not in order, but I often share these with folks. So some of them are going to be no, duh, Melissa, of course, I know about that. Um, but I spend a lot of time on the Can Child website. Um, I spend a lot of time on the Autism Professional Development Center website. Um, FIP, if you don't know, this is a program where um, Dathan and I both work together for quite some time. He's now the director there. I and mean, there are a whole host of resources about evidence-based practices and how I hold myself um, accountable. And then there's another page of them um, that uh, some of them are related to inclusion and what it looks like for access. Um, this developing child at Harvard, if you haven't taken a look at that, um, some of the resources about toxic stress and what that can do. And, um, but these are just, I just wanted to sort of uh, spray you with, these are some of my favorites. Maybe, what is it like Oprah's favorite things? These are Melissa's favorite things. <laughs> probably not as impressive as, as Oprah's, but all of these, you guys are, I know you're familiar with like challenge, challenging behavior website where they've got the practice briefs and the updated summaries of interventions. And um, then I wanted you guys to wait, let me, I should pause here and see if anybody has comments, questions. I mean, if I was unclear on anything. There's a, comment that made me giggle in the chat box Shelly says she remembers doing what you said about going to the university and getting the articles printed and then she said you could use your yellow marker on the article I miss reading like that <laughs> I'm a yellow marker girl myself so oh Shelly me too and I think I'm just too old to change like I love I love I feel like I can focus better if I have paper or the book. Um, and, I, and I think, and it's silly, but it also is one of my things that I enjoy. So if I was talking about a book, I can be really weird. I love the way books smell. Like I have this very huge sensory response to 
libraries and books because I just, you know, I know that sounds strange. Um, I so, love that. My granddaughter said the same thing recently when somebody asked her her favorite scent, the smell of a new book. I love oh, that. I do too. Oh, and I literally, I do just like stick my face right in it and smell it. So, Melissa, I want to point out we have about 15 minutes left okay. and I'm excited to hear your case examples. So. Okay. Thank you for the prompt for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what I wanted you to do, I, the, let me explain to you. So you have these two documents. Um, oh, you'll need to share your screen again. Yes, okay. oh. um, just Sorry. one sec, Gail, thank you. The PT Torticollis Visit 1, PT Torticollis Visit 2. And these are actually documents that a uh, physical therapist that I was coaching um, in Ohio um, and we have this process, Dave and I have this process where we, um, they're called coaching logs. And if you guys have looked in the, the handbook, the coaching handbook, there are a lot of examples in there. No, I need to expand this thing. Are you seeing that now? The visit one. And yeah. Yeah. she was this, the logs, I'm going to show you an electronic one here in a minute. But the idea was that she was going back after the visit and she was kind of writing the transcript of that visit to the best of her recollection. So it wasn't transcribing a recording, which takes way too long, but it was just a way of her really thinking about, cause she was working on her coaching. So how she was asking questions, what types of questions she was asking, that kind of thing. And so you can read through here her, recollections, and I just want to explain this to you. So her R1 coding means that's a reflective question, and we have this code of there are four types of questions. So awareness is a one, analysis is a two, alternatives is three, action is four. The point of this is not that you learn that. The point of it is that she was doing this as a way. She was in Southern Ohio. She was a new grad, and she was the only PT on her team. And she was, um, I think frightened is actually where she was, that she didn't know enough and that she wouldn't be doing a good job. And she was really worried about what that could, could look like. So getting herself in a community of practice, um, engaging in some extra work, what she was doing here. And you can see, so we certainly we, we don't have time to, um, I'm not going to read this to you, but you can scan down it that this is the interaction with the her, the physical therapist and the mother, the parent. And so they're talking through what's happening. And again, if you're reading it, you've got the copy. But um, so she she actually is helping this mother understand which muscle is tight, what that feels like. They go through that process. And then I'm going to just scan down here to where. She inserts this information right here. So I'm going to highlight this so you can just see where I'm talking about. So she then stops and she says to herself, so she's writing this and, and she knows I'm going to look at it too. So that's part of it. But she says, this is a question that I would have not asked prior to be, being introduced to coaching. I would have just told the parent the answer. I feel, however, that helping the mother think through things will help her more fully understand it and not have her asking, what did she say when I leave? And so then she continues on. Um, so she, the mom's helping her under, I mean, the mother's starting to understand, oh, so I need to have the baby look in an opposite direction of the way that it's tight. And so the PT is like, okay, she's starting to understand. So they go through here more. And she's pointing out, I should have said this too. So observation is one of the characteristics of coaching. Reflection is one of the characteristics of coaching. So she's also tagging the characteristics that she's using. So she's going through, and again, to the best of her recollection, it's not so much that it's exactly what happened, but it's her perception of what happened. And we go down here, I was looking more. Um, so then she just sort of gets this, here's what we're doing. Oh, I wanted to tell you if you haven't um, had time to read it. So the mom actually says to her, 
oh, could you come see what this looks like on the changing table? Because there's a mobile above and her she was starting to understand that her child's kind of hyperextending her neck and her chin is to the side. And the mom is starting to worry that might be making things worse. And I thought it was helping. So they actually disassemble the mobile. They go through this process. And when you get back to another reflection here. Um, I think there's another one. So you've got the whole transcript here. Yeah, there's not another. So if you look at um, visit two, she does the same thing. Um, and so she just did that a while and we were meeting over the, you know, Zoom or WebEx, we were meeting and I was just asking her how it matched, what steps she was taking. And um, we were looking at how do I know if I'm getting at fidelity to these practices? And so this was her way of putting in a little bit of extra work but direct benefit to her. And I think she would tell you if she were here to the mother and the infant because of, of her thoughtfulness about how well she was doing what she was doing. Um, and you guys can imagine a lot of people will say to me, you know, coaching doesn't work with all families. Um, you can't coach someone who has an intellectual disability or you can't, you know, and I'm just picking coaching because I talk about it all the time, but um, the, the idea of it, then my question back is how, how do you know you're coaching? And most people say, well, you know, I'm not doing such and such. And so stopping one thing does not mean I have fidelity to the new thing. There's actually, um, I was going to tell you guys, there's a, I love this term implementation dip is a, a real term that means, okay, I know what I was doing was not correct. So I'm not doing that. But I haven't yet mastered what it is I'm supposed to do. Have any of you felt that way about a new innovation? So what happens is no human, because of our human nature, likes that feeling. So we won't stay there very long. So we'll either work our backsides off to get the new innovation or what do we do? I'm just gonna go back to what I was doing because I think it was working anyway and I know how to do that. So that's where having a peer, having a community of practice keeps you from feeling, ooh, I don't like this, I don't wanna do it, I'm just gonna go back here. It keeps me on track for how I can think about the new innovation. So one example there, you've got the second visit because I wanted you to see how that um, transpired. And then she was actually not working with that family in a couple of weeks. So outcomes met. She was able to look at what she was doing and, and reflect on that. Now, I want to, and, and again, any comments you guys have, but I want to show you the fancy version of this now, what this looks like. Um, so you can see, this is about as fancy as uh, Dathan and I can get. Um, let me see if I can, are you seeing a, let me make a spreadsheet? It. Yes. Oh, yeah. So this is an Excel spreadsheet that we have a researcher that's working, that works with Dathan who helped us develop, let me span this out. So they document the visit up here. So it's, you know, who I was, who my support coach is. So this is somebody who's working with another person who's helping them um, analyze their practices. And then they go in and same as the word document, but here we're just, just typing away. So this was a visit of a mom meeting a teacher at the grocery store. They were going on a visit together in the grocery store. So you can see how this enters um, in here, the transcript. Then over here, the person who did the visit goes through and codes. So right here, this means I was revisiting my, our plan. Over here is I did observation. Oh, sorry, I should. This is down at the bottom, you'll see. Um, we developed a new plan for what was gonna happen in between. And here is, this is what we're gonna do together next time. And then across here, are the characteristics of coaching. 
So reflective questions, I put a number in. Um, it was it a closed ended question. These are types of feedback. And then these are contextualized, like inclusive or um, natural learning environment practices that are over here. So this is what the individual codes. Then if they have a mentor coach or it's Dathan or me, we go in and code over here. So they actually get feedback on how what they were coding, what they thought they were doing is matching the practice. And then I'm gonna show you this part, this is cool. So coaching log summary. So this person has done this six times and these are her data across these six months. So you can see she did it October through March. And this is the presence or absence of these. And then the number is tallied. So she asked like here, three awareness questions, one analysis question. And if those of you who are into data, if you look at this, you'll see, see all these zeros up here. You can see actually the trajectory of her questions changing. We didn't have all of these pieces down here, but let me show you this. Here's the fancy part. So we have this dashboard that, let me make it where you can see it, gives her after six logs where she has fidelity across these practices. And so she's not there yet, as we saw. It graphs each individual characteristic. So down here, this is what her yes, no questions look like. Here's what her variety of questions look like. Here's what her feedback looks like. And so if she were in a program that is supporting people to get fidelity, um, in six months is sort of the data we have that it takes people, that might be interesting to you guys. That an innovation that's about as early as you can sort of see it takes off four to six months. Um, but so she will keep going in her work um, to the point where this will turn green and it'll say fidelity at the top and these reds will go away. But the way we programmed it is these data populate this dashboard. So I wanted you to see a fancy way of <laughs> a more complicated way of sort of, wow, how am I holding myself accountable for this? But then also really the basis, what the physical therapist in Ohio was doing was the same thing. She was pushing herself um, through her own kind of homework that she was establishing uh, for herself to look at that level of detail of the practice. And again, we've just, we just have a body of work around coaching in these practices. But I think if you're looking at you know, a feeding or swallowing intervention, or you're looking at an assistive technology, the way you collect data on yourself, not just the outcomes with the consumer, but how we look at what we're doing ourselves is really that piece to tying all of this together. And then you know, even if I'm not getting the outcomes that I would want or hope, but if I'm doing the practice the way that it was intended to be done, then there are other factors contributing to why the outcome might not be met. But I can still feel okay, even though I'm bummed the child didn't learn this or the teacher didn't follow through, something like that. But I can look back at me and go, okay, what did I do? And I can either go, oops, I think maybe that was my plan instead of her plan or our plan. You know, there are things that you can think through um, to consider. Let me, one more thing. Just want to make sure. Are we seeing it? Yes. To the end. Yep, we're done. That's what I thought. I thought we are finished. I, I was going to share too. Um, I have a video that I'm going to share a link to just of a discussion about evidence-based practices and um, very similar to what we talked about today but if you guys want to revisit that um, it's uh, uh, the person in Virginia who's in charge of the professional development program there so it'll be sort of you know, like Deb and Gail and then Dave and Rush and myself so you'll have access to that but comments or questions feedback what let me know what you're thinking. You know, you, you gave me an interesting piece of information that I did not have before. 
I, I think a lot about, um, in my own practice, about changing the system, the way we do things in a particular district or a particular agency. And the research about that says that any significant systems change takes about three years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's from that same NIRN site that you were mm -hmm. talking about. But you just said it takes about six months to innovate on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important information for all of us to have if we're, if we're really trying to improve our practice and do things in new ways. Um, I love permission to give myself six months to at least do it well. You, you know, it, and I think too, it's like, it, it really is that, you know, for the, the entire team or the entire program or the entire school, if you think of where each person is, and, and I should give the caveat, that is with me um, trying. The, uh -huh. data, the data are much slower if the person is resistant. You know, so let's say the physical therapist didn't want to do that, but her agency was making her. Can you see the difference? So oh, yeah. <laughs> she, yeah, she probably wouldn't write those comments. She probably would, you know, she wouldn't put the effort into it unless the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the reason she's doing it is incentivized that you need to do this or you may no longer work here or you need to, you know, for some people, that's what it, what it takes. You know, Karen says in the chat, it all feels very overwhelming with all the things we need to do in our work and the different children and families yeah. we see. Can you talk, speak to that in terms of fidelity of practice? Yes, I sure can. And Karen, I've been admiring you there with um, your rake in the leaves. And I think that's you. Um, I love that picture when, when I first saw it. That was the last thing I wanted to happen was for that to feel overwhelming. And I should have thought of it because that electronic log is kind of mind boggling. But I, what I was trying to do was show there are very simple ways we can attack this. And then there are very complex ways that we can also bring the science to, I mean, that's actually a research project where we're documenting at that level. But um, I, Gail, this is probably not what you want me to say, but Karen, I agree. Doing the jobs we do well is, it's a very difficult job. It's a lot and it's, um, I, I really have never met anybody who says, geez, I just don't have enough to do. You know, I'm not <laughs> even sure this is a full-time job. I mean, no one has ever said that to me. And here's the part that I want to emphasize. So when I think of my day, and now my topics are different, you know, with the role I have. But when I think of my day, the gradu is what drives me, you know, to overwhelmation. I know that's not a word, but it should be. Um, but that, did you do this paperwork? Did you see this form changed again? Oh, uh, you have to do this if you're gonna gas up the car. You have, you know, like all this stuff. And then it's like why I wanted to be an OT or why I wanted to be a speech language pathologist is like, it feels so far away from what I really wanna focus on every day. And so like one of the things that bonked Dathan and I in the head was we had practice coaches. So we had coaches and, and it's kind of a different way of looking at supervision. So there was, there is, you know, a little bit of hierarchy there because the person is supporting the other person, but really their peers. But what we saw happening, Karen, was, you know, busy stuff happens. And then we'd be like, what, how did the observations go? Guy and they're like, oh, we had to cancel because of blood. Like we didn't get to. And so what we were noticing is we started keeping track of how much time practice discussions or let's look at a video together or let's. All of that got pushed off to the side so that we could all, let's get together on how we do our note now for billing because H, you know, they've told us to do something different. That was what was taking over. And so that's that piece of, okay, I can, I can control what I prioritize to at some point, but if I don't have a program or a leadership who values that piece, that's what I started with earlier is, 
then I really have to do it at night after my kids go to bed or in the morning on Saturday before everybody else gets up. And as an old person who's done that my whole life, that you can only do that so long. And you keep doing it and you sacrifice other things or you stop doing that so you can do the other things. So, so we're about out of time, but I did want to get to Carol's question. She says, can you comment on IEPs written with goals and objectives that are not evidence-based practice? So what, what, what I, I assume she means, what should you do when, when you encounter those? And I know that could take a whole nother hour and a half. But. Yeah. And Carol, I'm filtering because I have all these comments that I just want to, you know, be funny and say, um, but it, it, it really wouldn't be funny. Um, so if I'm involved in the IEP, I'm going to speak up when it's happening. And so I might say something like, um, okay, how does that fit with what he does every day? Or how is that going to be a part of his school day? Or what is that going to look like uh, for teacher so-and-so? If somebody's doing one of these, you know, we'll say this sound with precision X percent of the time, you know, for two consecutive weeks or something that makes no sense. Um, then I'm gonna work it right there. If I'm handed that, you know, like if I weren't in that, cause that's the worst, then that's what Gail was talking about. We have a systems issue because we should not have people being handed those outcomes that they weren't involved in developing, especially if they're not good. <laughs> like somebody hands me a pie, if, you know, it's good. I might be okay with it, but yuck you know if it's not going to make any sense but I think if we don't speak up then we become you know a party to it or are we still in a place where we have PT goals and OT goals and speech goals or have we moved to these are the students and it takes everybody you can't have one outlier you know it takes all of us to commit to these are the ways that we're going to measure the child's progress as part of the, the school day and you're right, Gail, that whole way we write those outcomes and what that looks like in the process. Um, but I also, Carol, you know, because I'm old and cranky, I like have gotten to the point where if I got handed that, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm either going to fix it and do it at my level, the way that makes sense, and then report the data back, or I'm going to go to the source and say, yeah, we can't do this. It's, we're really spinning our wheels. And going to the source is always this. Carol says she was talking about a, an out-of-state move-in, so oh, one that got handed to her. Um, you know, we, I, several times during this presentation today, you've suggested uh, new topics for Echo Ties to me. So um, maybe we'll have to have you back sometime and and talk about some of those other topics. We are out of time, so I wanna um, ask Deb to stop the recording.